I'm Ashley Lanquist. I'm very honored to speak with you all today. I'm here with two stars of the University Blockchain Research Initiative, Angela and Nisreen. And we're going to talk about their projects, which worked with Ubri. So um, it's going to be an awesome conversation. As Lauren said, I went here at Haas. I finished in 2018. I started Mobi, which is the mobility blockchain consortium for automakers. Now I work at the World Economic Forum. I'm on the blockchain and distributed ledger technology uh, team there. Yeah. And um, why don't you briefly introduce? Oh, okay. Uh, hello, to everybody. It's an honor to be here sharing this stage with you. I'm Angela Cordova. I'm a Colombian attorney. Uh, recently, I got my degree here from Berkeley Law as an LLM student. And now I'm working in the Central Bank of Colombia. Alrighty. Hello, everyone. It is such an honor to be here. I am Nasreen Barianwala. I'm currently a sophomore at the University of Michigan, and I'm studying computer science. And I am also the president of Blockchain at Michigan, a student-run organization uh, promoting education and providing resources for blockchain at, in blockchain in the space at Michigan. Okay, so we're going to talk about their two projects, and then hopefully at the end, if we have time, we're going to open up to some discussion about blockchain for social impact. So, so Angela, yeah, why don't you tell us what was your project that you worked on while you were here? Okay, I'll, if I can define my project with a simple sentence, I would say is land registration problem regime solution. Uh, I've been studying from the legal perspective how smart contracts could solve the problem of registration in, home, in my home nation, in Colombia. I think the project has the potential to guarantee to those displacement victims to overcome uh, the problems over the land. Um, to explain the project, I need to set some context. I'll be more specific later. In Colombia, basically, there are two main group of people. High income and low income population. Middle class here doesn't play a significant role. Um, low income population usually live in rural areas in the countryside and they are the most vulnerable group. Just not for the lack of opportunities in terms of money, but for the lack of protection from institutions, government and the law. And my project, I think, try to assert that smart contracts can make all the transaction over land in a more secure and in a more democratic way. Currently, the land registration system in my country is costly and demands legal knowledge. Uh, according to some public figures, around the 50% of the entire Colombian land is registered. That means the other half has no determined owner and it boots civil war in my country. So nevertheless, this reality, I'm confident that we can use these new technologies to overcome those problems and close it the gap between not registered land and registered. Um, in the suggested model of my project, parties can translate contractual language into a code. And this code will reduce processes around the registration and also fees and cost. This is basically the explanation. Great. So blockchain for land restitution, um, taking advantage of the features of blockchain, which we'll get, and, and smart contracts, which yes. we'll get into. That's it. So, and sorry, guys, I have a bit of a cold today. So <laughs> if I sneeze, it's not. It's not. <laughs> um, Nisreen, why don't you tell us about your project? Sure. So in around May 2019, it was in the winter semester of the school year, and I started to get really interested in blockchain for social good. A lot of the space right now has a lot of focus into financial transactions, which is a very good thing. Money drives many things in this world. But I wanted to look at healthcare. I've grown up uh, being kind of tangentially involved in the healthcare space, and I realized that America was facing a huge crisis, and that is, I'm sure as some of you have heard, the opioid crisis. As of now, there is no way to track opioid prescriptions in a safe and sustainable manner throughout the country. There are many different silos, many different databases that hold individual information, but there's nothing preventing me from saying, 
driving from Michigan and going to Ohio, seeing another doctor and receiving the same prescription. And that allows for prescription fraud. Um, there's no way to track over prescription. So if doctors are writing too many or there's a suspicious activity, there's no fast way to track that. And I realized that blockchain through, has been proven out to be used in supply chain and has that capacity to track things across areas and across divisions, across regions. And I figured, all right, there has to be a way to take this prescription information and translate it to a blockchain application. And so my project is called Vivica. At the moment, there are two people working on it, myself and one other student at University of Michigan. And our goal is to be able to take prescriptions track them and so not replace the prescription due to HIPAA laws and regulations, but rather be a companion system that lays over top of the current model and will track the prescription number, dosage, and the time elapsed from the latest prescription so that doctors can safely track uh, a patient's usage. And now many of you might be thinking, all right, well, MediLedger exists and there are other applications. Well, that tracks it from the manufacturer, supplier, and distribution level. And my project really focuses on the doctor, patient, and the pharmacy level, so the second tier. Um, it does people very good to, okay, yeah, I know that Purdue Pharma has distributed this to Walgreens, but that doesn't help the individual at the other end who really might have an addiction or is suffering through the crisis, and there's no way to really catch that. And so that's where my project has originated from. Ms. Reed, while we're on you, can you please explain to us what about smart contracts are you taking advantage of in this project, or what was it about blockchain and smart contracts that solves a problem and unlocks new capabilities for you? So the aspect of blockchain that our project is really honing in on is really the aspect of you can create a token that represents something and then that those transactions, so to speak, can be tracked. So by the, when the doctor kind of, let's say, prescribes something, that will create a token in our system, and then we can track that transaction. So when the patient receives that prescription, there's a record of that, and then when the patient goes to the pharmacy to get that filled, there's a record of that as well. And due to the nature of blockchain, you can make sure that, A, the prescription hasn't been tampered with. So right now, there are still paper opioid prescriptions, and in today's world, people can forge almost anything, passports, IDs, money. So it's quite easy to replicate a paper document and let's say change the refill number. So instead of one refill, you're getting 10. But with our system, with this blockchain, the immutability aspect and the fact that it's embedded in this token, the pharmacy can look at the token, look at the prescription, and say, no, wait, we cannot give this to you. On our system, it says one refill. And that's a way that it can track uh, fraud. And for the overprescription method, the other uh, method that we were really looking into is tracking via public key. So right now, if the DEA or any government agency wants to really audit or look at, okay, where are all these things going, it's a lengthy process. There's no way to access the data in a meaningful manner. But here you can say, all right, uh, there's a region here that we suspect there's suspicious activity. Let's get a list of all the public IDs of the doctor doctors that are active in that space, and you can simply look up that ID and see, all right, they have prescribed XYZ prescriptions in this time frame. So those are the two aspects that we really found fascinating about blockchain, and now we're trying to find a protocol that will fit those needs as we move forward. I was just going to ask if there was a particular protocol you were working on. But... Yeah, so right now we have a, a proof of concept style prototype. And, and that's done in Solidity, because that's what we teach at Blockchain at Michigan. It's what we're most familiar with. Obviously, for many reasons, Solidity cannot actually be used for this application. So now we're looking into things like Hyperledger, uh, Factum, I just heard about a couple of days ago, so I'm going to look into that. Corda, there are many different things that we could build off. And so now we will take a deep dive into that. So my last question to you is, is are you, uh, what kind of configuration in terms of permissioned or permissionless or private, public, would it so, make sense? Yeah, this definitely cannot be a public chain as it is personal. There is health information on there. HIPAA and GDPR laws would kill me before I could ever have this on a public chain. So we are thinking of permissioned. Uh, the doctor would have the permissions to read and write to the chain. The pharmacy would have permission to read it. They, there's no reason why they should be altering a prescription. And then the patient will just have read access. Uh, patients do have the right to their own data. And so this allows them to still be involved in the process, but pr protects the, everyone as a whole by not having them you know, be able to change anything. Great. Sounds really interesting. Yeah. Thank you.
And Angela, for you, what problems was block is blockchain really tackling or smart contracts mm. tackling in uh, your solution? Uh, the problem, the real problem happened 50 years ago. And uh, as may all you know, Colombia is one of the most conflict countries in the world. We are facing a cruel civil war. Um, there are have been a lot of multiple deaths, drug trafficking, and the problem that shocked me most was its internal displacement. Um, to explain, I need to ask a question to the audience. Um, can you imagine like being in your humble house where you have raised your children, where you have small potato crops, and suddenly a group of people fully armed interrupt into your house and say to you, if you don't leave, we will kill you and we kill your children. I apologize for being so frank, but this is a reality. This is the reality of more than 8 million Colombians right now, over the last five decades. And this is not the worst part. Thanks to some recent peace agreement and some government efforts, these victims can return to their land, but when they arrived again, they realized they were no owners anymore. Why? Because the land they used to possess was sold to third parties who are now the owners, or when they came to the land, they realized they were no owners anymore because there were no record in the book of the registry office. Um, so I think the solution could be smart contracts. Why? First, um, because Recently, there has been proven that the smart contracts can record real estate transactions. Taking advantage of blockchain's ability to run resiliently and being anti-tampered with corruption, you know, we can save the record of the land property regime. You know, so I'm analyzing from the legal perspective what change in the legal framework we need to do in order to adopt this technology in their public registry record. Great. Great. So I think we have about five minutes. So what all of you guys are thinking about uh, blockchain technology and applying it to various use cases. So within the social impact realm, we wanted to get one or two ideas from you about what you're thinking. Um, as a bit of a starter, one project that I manage is an anti-corruption pilot on permissionless Ethereum in Colombia with World Economic Forum and Colombian Inspector General's Office and IDB. And we're running a public procurement system, a public procurement auction on smart contracts on Ethereum. And that's going to pilot in the first quarter. So that's one interesting social impact use case that aims to reduce corruption in public procurement, which is usually uh, the most susceptible place in the public sector where corruption happens in terms of dollar amounts. So anyway, so uh, what are you guys thinking? Yes? Can I ask them a question instead? Uh, Do we have a social impact idea first? Yes? Love it. Yeah. What it's do you great think? Great idea. Yeah. And I think that has interesting use cases too, because that means you're monetizing something or giving something value that inherently you may not see the immediate value in, let's say, picking up a piece of trash or doing active environmental good. But here, you're incentivized to get that reward, and then that also has further ramifications down the line for bigger financial gains or incentives. So I love that. Is anyone working on something related to that? <laughs> no, it's, it's a great idea. We should talk are, after. Talk to him. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, um, corruption is particularly interesting because I think, in my opinion, features of blockchain technology related to censorship resistance and decentralization 
are very suitable for corruption use cases or anti-corruption. Um, when you don't want to rely on any humans or government actors or anyone who might collude or might be able to be bribed to alter records, blockchain seems like the best fit technology for that. So, yes, true. Uh, I think government could deploy these kind of tools to achieve an open approach to data, make mm -hmm. things faster and more simple for people. Yes, the phone. Want to ask your question? So sure, I can elaborate on the university side. So actually, I'm very uh, thankful and honored that I have Dr. Adrian's. And so he's been a, super, a real support in channeling the Ripple gift into these respective areas. And so hopefully by the end of this year, I will have a meeting with the dean of the medical school and some other deans in tangential programs in order to let us beta test our technology. Uh, through the School of Medicine, obviously not with real prescriptions, but with like file sharing or just test the robustness of the idea of the code, make sure it's usable, make sure it solves the right problem. And I've been in contact with some researchers at the U of, uh, U of M uh, Opioid Research Initiative, and they have given their input into that idea and identified uh, exactly where we need to focus. So I have been very grateful and excited to see what steps uh, the university as a whole takes with the Ripple gift and for blockchain in the future. Um, sadly for me, the reality has been different. Uh, I've held some meetings with the government and with institutions. Uh, sadly, they have like other priorities. Um, but my project requires modification of regulation, and I need congressmen to be on the same page to get this this idea. We are trying with my team. We're trying to like finding a new approach. Yeah, to be close to Congress, but has been hard. I can't lie about that. And Next I think even question. like moving forward with this healthcare application, eventually I will run into that area where either something's HIPAA will need to adapt, there needs to be a top-down approach for implementation, because a system with a decentralized nature is only as good as the people who use it. So if there are doctors that don't, aren't on the system or don't comply to the standards, well, then there's still loopholes and things will still fall through the gaps. State level, and you, you have to start yeah. But that's where regulations can help. Exactly. Great. I think we're right on time. Thank you for your questions and comments. Thank you, Ash, Thank Ashley, you. Angela, and Nazreen. Thank you. Thank you.